Hello and welcome to another interview from Improv News. Uh, we are yeah, happy today to have Rafe Chase here from Bats Improv San Francisco, also from Three Fall, also from True Fiction Magazine. Uh, yes, I yeah, I think that's, that's yeah, all. Uh, yes, uh, that's all. No, I've, I've been in other groups, but that's, what, <laughs> uh, that's good enough. <laughs> that's good enough. Uh, if you, if you want to be more in, then uh, please tell us. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, you are an improviser and teacher. You're mm -hmm. teaching improv and you're a writer and a photographer. Mm -hmm. But we want to just talk about improv, I think. That's fine. It's fine, yeah. Um, we're here in the 20th Festival of the Improv Amsterdam Festival, and you played with your group Three for All here with Tim Orr and Stephen Kieran. Yes. Kieran. And yeah, hello and welcome. That's now the opening. So <laughs> we want to um, talk to you a little bit about the history of improv. You started early on in 1978. That's correct, yes. In, uh, I think October of 78. Why? why uh, you started to play or learn improv, or how it was this time? Well, I, I always wanted to be an actor, even when I was little, uh, but I was very shy. And uh, so I thought I couldn't be an actor because I was so shy, but then when I was about 22, I thought, okay, if I don't do this, I'm going to wake up 40 years old and never have done the thing I love. So I made myself take an acting class. Uh, so I actually had, from going to college and doing some poetry readings and things like that, I had gotten over a little of my stage fright and shyness. And uh, so I took an acting class and it actually, I got a good response. Uh, I hated learning the lines though, but I got a good response. And I did acting class for about nine months. And then I was on Hate Street with a friend of mine in San Francisco and I saw a flyer for an improv group. And I thought, I want to go check that out. Uh, they had improv classes. So I saw, I took the class before I saw the group perform. And the minute they started the exercises, I was so happy. I loved it immediately. And uh, I had a natural facility for it, apparently, and uh, just took to it. And, and then scripted acting fell by the wayside. and. Uh, uh, it was with a group called Flash Family in San Francisco. It was run by a woman named Sue Walden and Jim Lilly was her husband and also one of the leaders of the group. And uh, they were very, uh, very generous with me. They gave me a lot of their attention and time. And within three and a half months of taking that first class, I was guesting in a show. And uh, that was it. I was performing since that night in October of 78. <laughs> and, uh, and I worked with that group for about two and a half years. So how much member there was? How many? Yeah. There were, there was six of us, I remember, no, eight, eight of us. There was Jim Lilly, uh, Joe Gregg, uh, myself, and uh, another gentleman whose name I know, I can't remember, and then uh, Sue uh, and two other women. And uh, so there was about eight of us. And it was very interesting, it was good training. I got training in the games, and uh, that was great. I still am so happy I got that so early. Uh, so the first half of the show would be games. And I think we also did a silent, little silent, 10 minute silent piece. And then the second half was their adjustment of the Herald, basically. They called Life. Not the Keith Johnson Life game, but uh, Life. And it was simply getting a, a concept. I remember like, Truth or Beauty was the rap. And uh, uh, then we would get that, and then we'd do a series of scenes based on that for the rest of the, of the evening. And then I think we'd end with a, uh, a conducted piece, which was very popular back then and hardly ever done now. Uh, so it was great, great night of improv, and uh, it was in a club in, in North Beach in San Francisco called the Old Spaghetti Factory. And uh, it, was, it was great. I was, I was just thrilled to be doing it. They had studied with a group called Improv Inc., I believe, uh, that was there where they came from. And I guess before that, I think it was the committee that spawned that. So that, I think that was the genesis of that. And how, how big was the improv scene these days in San Francisco? Was it 
popular? It was popular. Uh, it was done in clubs and uh, cafes, you know, or bars. So, uh, and I could think there was I can think of at least four groups at the time. There was there was my that group, Flash Family, which was sort of the more um, what I call it craft oriented, m leaning more towards serious work. There was certainly a place for that there. Uh, it wasn't, we weren't expected to be so fast, although I could be fast. Uh, and uh, uh, then there was a group called Spaghetti Jam, which was the click, click, click. Uh, very talented people though. And then there was a group called Papaya Juice. Uh, a colleague of mine named Barbara Scott was in a group called uh, Screaming Mimi's that would sometimes play up here. She was in Santa Cruz. Uh, so there were several, there were groups around. It was a, it was a pretty hot, exciting scene. And uh, uh, it was very exciting. I worked with that group for about two and a half years. After the initial, how do I put this? After the initial period of being new to it, green, learning, 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 I started within, I'd say, six months to start having opinions, uh, <laughs> which is normal. I, uh, uh, so I thought, oh, this works. This doesn't work. This is all, you know, my opinion. So, uh, why are we doing this now? It didn't work last week. It didn't work the week before. So I, I started having feelings and thoughts about how things should be done. Uh, what happened also was this is a funny story. I'm just going to tell it anyway. Here's what happened. When I was in Flash Family, when I joined, we couldn't wear shoes. We, uh, it was. I mean, I think because they wanted to do movement, also to be very free. I think it was what they had done in their other group. So we wore socks. Uh, so, you know, I wanted to start wearing shoes on stage. I just thought, and I understood the idea of not stepping on people. So I just asked, you know, could I, I asked Sue Walden, may I wear running shoes, soft soled shoes? And say, let me wear shoes. So that open the Pandora shoe box in a way, uh, <laughs> where the other members wanted to wear, wear shoes, including a woman uh, named Linda, who was in the group, uh, who was sort of a friend of mine. Uh, and uh, she wore a shoe with a heel on it, and uh, I'm talking so much out of school, but I don't care. And she stepped on one of the members' feet uh, with a heel. Well, a in America, we would say it hit the fan. Uh, big, big blowout. Very people, very upset. Now, in retrospect, having been in groups, I understand how that stuff can percolate underneath that, and then there's just an incident that incites it. So the group blew up, and um, <laughs> from a step on a feet. <laughs> yes, yeah, yes. Uh, all because I wanted to wear shoes. Uh, so uh, then, Joe. And uh, Linda and Doug Castle, that was the other person who was a very, very talented guy. He is still. Uh, they, they left. They just left. They, they'd had enough. So it left me and Sue and Jim in the group. I was new. I didn't have all these feelings, so I didn't feel the necessity to leave. And I was still very grateful to them for their mentoring of me. So then the next good thing happens, which is now we got to get new people. So... I, I was almost like a, like a boy with his mom and dad going shopping for siblings. You know, so let's go look at groups and see who we want, who we can adopt for my <laughs> brother or sister. So like a headhunter. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, okay. So uh, <laughs> one of the things we did, we saw a group that was downtown at a little club called the Mustard Seed uh, called Sunset Scavengers, which was the name of our garbage company at the time. And... Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm watching them uh, on stage, and I, I see this woman come out, this slim, attractive, uh, dark-haired woman come out, and she is amazing, just so charismatic, so talented. And uh, I, I, want, I want her. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> she was great. And also there was another woman in that group, too, who was very talented, named Marion. The woman who I pointed at was Regina. I saw Regina for the first time. And uh, she was just stupendous. So, Regina Saizi, uh, Regina Saizi, who uh, member of, of Bats Improv, currently the dean of that school. Uh, so, uh, so she they they joined. She and Marion, and I was very very pleased with that. And uh, and then a, a woman named Virginia Musanti took a class. I remember being in the class with her, and 
and her playing a nurse, and I, you get that feeling, and you must know it as improvisers, like, yeah. oh, you, oh, look yes. what you can do. Oh, look how you're going out to me. I just fell in love with her. <laughs> and so uh, she joined the group. And then also a guy named uh, Whit Mather. So we had a new, new group, and that was great fun. Fun to work with those new people, and uh, I had people now who were new. I was now the oldest member besides the uh, members who had started it, the two leaders. And uh, so that was really fun. We had a great time. Of course, I'm getting more and more opinions. <laughs> and uh, I want to do things my way. I'm starting to do that, and uh, which is all just natural and human. And so then we started uh, another group called Riot Squad. Regina and I and, and uh, Virginia put together a group that would do scripted work and improv. And because we were doing scripted work, Sue, who was the leader of the group, said, you know, okay, you know, I'll, I'll, that's okay, you can do that group. So, uh, so we did Riot Squad and that was really fun. It was great to write, write sketch comedy and try to figure out how to successfully insert improv into that. And, uh, can I, can I yes. ask? Uh, don't forget it, uh, Riot Squad, but what, what did you do for a living in this time? Uh, just Very good to... question. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> uh, what did I do for a living? I think at that point I was, when I was trying to figure out what to do, one thing I thought I would do is maybe teach preschool or teach kids. So I, I, uh, I had studied that and I was, I was being a teacher's assistant at that time. Uh, how, how old was uh, it? Uh, it was elementary school, so I think I did like third and fourth grade, then second grade, and then I did kindergarten for a while, which is, I love kindergartners. Uh, uh, so I was working with little kids. Uh, it was like kind of a three-quarter time job. Okay. Just trying to make money, not making a lot. All I really wanted to do was improv, you know. It's like dragging myself into school. Uh, 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 so, yeah, that's what I was doing. Right squad. Mm -hmm. Right squad. So then, uh, <coughs> second question: How uh, how often do you play in that time? How, oh, we did uh, with Flash Family. We did once a week shows. I think they were on Thursdays. Uh, with Riot Squad, we did individual runs, a uh, little two nights or three nights here. So uh, you know, maybe probably would shake out to be maybe three shows a month, something like that. Mm -hmm. We played a place called the Other Cafe, which was a great venue at the time. Uh, and then I finally became what we call too big for my britches, uh, too, too opinionated, and it was time for me to leave Flash Family, so I, I left. And in retrospect, I could have left in a, a more gentle way, but it was, yeah, it was more dramatic than it needed to be, but, you know, I was, what, 25 years old or something, okay. you know, what can you do? Uh, uh, so the but you leave Flash Family and you s they would still have uh, Riot, Riot Squad, Squad. yes. Okay. And then so we're doing Riot Squad for the next next few years, which was it was great fun and, and very exciting. And uh, we do that for uh, a few years. I uh, is it around this time? It, yeah, I'm writing a lot of material for Regina in, in that group, and because she's working as an actor also. Yes, working. Regina. Yes, Regina's a very gifted scripted actor. And uh, so it was very fun to write for her. And I could write things that had a dramatic quality to them, you know, as well as comic. And she certainly could play that balance very well. So uh, I, I think it was around some point in there I started working on a one-woman show for Regina, too. And uh, we're doing Riot Squad, I'm working on that. And then um, what happens next? What's next? We do Riot Squad for a while, and then... Uh, people want to do some other things. My my colleague Virginia, who's in that group, she gets pregnant, and so the Riot Squad kind of drops away. And also, I'm starting to get this idea in my head that I'm not as good an improviser as I should be, that I that I'm a better writer than an improviser, and I, you know, I, I think I'm comparing myself to other people and uh, getting very critical of myself. So then I decide, okay, I won't, I won't be an improviser. I'll be a writer. I'll stop improvising. Roundabout. Uh, let's see. Well, this is probably mid of the eighties. Mm -hmm. Middle of the eighties. Yes, maybe eighty three, eighty four, somewhere in there. Uh, so I'm working on Regina's show. I'm also unhappy. 
that bad. I, I, I start getting an ulcer. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, after about two years of this, I'm in the hospital. And I'm laying in the hospital with this ulcer. And I'm, I review my life. I go, hmm, okay. What's wrong with my life? And I go, you know, Ray, that thing you love most of all, you're not doing. And I said, when we get out of this hospital, we're going to go do that. So what I did was when I uh, got out, I mean, it wasn't that dramatic, but I, when I got out of the hospital, I thought, I'm going to go take an improv class. And I'm not going to say that I have an experience. I'm not going to, I'm just going to come in as if it's all brand new. And uh, so I looked around, and by that point, there's improv classes, a lot of improv classes around. And uh, so I took, uh, I took a, I started taking improv classes. And I guess now we're talking, I joined BATS in 87. This is probably 85. And now I am really happy because I'm now back to just being a student. Uh, I took a class with a, through UC Berkeley Extension. The woman who taught it had nowhere near as much experience as me. But I did not, I, zip, I just did my work. People were kind of like, well, that guy's good. Uh, Talented. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I had a great time, and I started meeting uh, other, other improvisers that I'd never met before, and uh, studying with uh, different, uh, different teachers. And uh, uh, so that was, uh, was very exciting. And then Regina said, because she was doing, now she's doing scripted work, uh, a friend of, that she knows knows that there's thing, this thing called uh, Bay Area Theater Sports. That's what Bats Improv was called originally. And that we should try it. And I said, well, what is it? She said, well, it's two teams competing. And I'm going, oh, yeah, it's com competition improv? I, <laughs> my, my brain doesn't like that. And she, then they tell me this one thing that makes me hate it, which is, if you say something that is uh, indecent or inappropriate, you have to wear a bag on your head for a minute. It's like, <laughs> you're, oh, come on. Now, I'm back to my big britches at that point. It's like, oh, come on. But I thought, okay, let's go try. So we took the workshop, and it was Dan O'Connor, I believe, was, uh, he might have been teaching that, or was it? I'm not sure about that. Uh, and uh, it, was, it was fun. I, I enjoyed it. Uh, I never warmed up to the bag idea, and we dropped that eventually. Thank God. Uh, I mean, to each their own, right? You know, but for me, that didn't work. Yeah. I'll keep track of what I do and what I don't do. Uh, so, uh, so we did. Uh, we did Bats Improv. I joined that group, and because they were just, they'd only been going about five months. They were, they were new. They were looking for improvisers, and Regina and I were experienced improvisers. That you know, that. It's what they needed. So, uh, who, they, who was the founders of of uh, Bats? Was it? You know, that's an interesting yeah. thing. You know, very interesting in that. That's why I ask. Well, we can <laughs> jump back for a, a, a while, back to where we're doing Riot Squad. I forgot about this part. When, <laughs> when I said like people want to do other things in Riot Squad, then the people who own the other cafe, the two owners, Chip and Bob, I believe. Uh, they come to Regina and I and they say, you know, we'd like you to start a group uh, of the other cafe players. I'm a little skeptical about it, but, you know, it sounds okay. So we, and we would be able to do what we're doing in Riot Squad, which I could, you know, we write sketches, we do improv, and I could use some of the sketches from Riot Squad that I'd written. So that uh, sounds okay. I'm a little trepidatious about having these guys in charge of us, but uh, we'll go for it. So uh, then we start auditioning people. Uh, we auditioned some wonderful, wonderful people for that group. I remember including Nora Dunn was one of the people who auditioned. She was on, later on Saturday Night Live. Uh, a woman named Linda Hill, who I had just thought of recently. I looked up online and still performing. She was great. And a woman named Rebecca Stockley auditioned for us. Uh, she had no improv training. Uh, I, I believe I'm correct on that. And, uh, but she'd done a lot of theater. So Rebecca is now joins the, the uh, other cafe players. Well, that goes on for a few months, but then Bob and Chip are starting to say, we think you should do this. We don't think you should do that. Uh, and um, that's, that's what happens when people are in charge. And I'm going, I don't agree. I don't agree. Uh, yes, this, no, not that. So we're bumping heads. And then 
one day they asked to meet us, and uh, I said, Regina, that's it. They're gonna, it's gonna, they're gonna access. And she says, No, no, they're not. So they bring us in, and they start talking, and then they start leading towards the fact that they don't want us. And I start laughing, and uh, Regina was not laughing, <laughs> but uh, she's looking at me like I'm mad. But it's like it's exactly what that I suggested that they're gonna do, and I didn't really care at all. It was, it was not what I wanted to do. So anyway, jumping back to Bats Improv. Before I was involved in it, William Hall, if I'm getting this right, had knew a woman now named, had known a woman named Rebecca Stockley, who had, I'm hoping I'm getting this all right on her, her side of this, had gone to Seattle and there had learned improv after having been in San Francisco when we were doing the other cafe players. So now she has learned improv, she's teaching improv, she comes back to San Francisco on a visit, she's at a house. Uh, some social event with William Hall and she does some little improv trick with him uh, where she says you know I heard this great story and then she actually gets him to tell the story yeah. and uh, and then he realizes what's happened and he's very delighted so he's in a group called the Bologna Brothers a, 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 a Commedia dell'arte uh, style group and invites Rebecca Stockley down to San Francisco to teach the initial workshop with he and some other actors. And they put up a show and they love it, love it, love it, love it. So uh, then they, they make Bay Area Theater Sports and that's how they started. And then maybe a year, so I joined about six months in and then maybe two years after that, Rebecca and her uh, now husband Paul Killam moved to San Francisco and then join the group. So that was a strange full circle where Rebecca and I are back in, in together. So, uh, okay. yes. Yeah. Yeah. Don't forget, but uh, did you know from whom uh, Rebecca Stockley learned in uh, San Francisco, uh, uh, in Seattle, up in Seattle? Uh, I should, <laughs> it's not but I don't. Okay. I don't remember the gentleman's name. But he was the the big uh, Seattle guy at the time. You may know him. He may I still know be there. Only Randy Dixon. I think it was Randy yeah. Dixon. Yes, thank you. Yes, yeah. I should know Randy Dixon's name. Yes, I believe it was Randy Dixon. Okay, so oh, that's a that's an interesting full circle. <laughs> Hello, Randy. Uh, uh, because uh, Randy is uh, often in Berlin. Uh, he's one of the every year uh, member of the festival cast and the international festival in Berlin. That that's why we know Randy Dixon well. Oh, cool. And it's interesting that uh, Rebecca Sobe. Okay, yeah. we will ask Rebecca her, her version of that. Yes, I'm sure it's, it's different than mine. Okay, so um, you joined in? Um, um, I joined, yes, yeah. in uh, early 87. Mm. And uh, they, they had a great thing going. Uh, it, the great thing about this, as opposed to other groups I had joined as opposed to formed, is that it was player run, uh, that it was... There was nobody, I own this. There was no one like that. And William Hall, I give him a lot of credit for uh, encouraging that to be the, the case because he could have made it William's. Taken uh, the power. Yeah, he yeah. could have made it his own, but he didn't, and it was very smart of him. And it's paid off. Uh, so, it, uh, so, yeah, I started doing that, and I really enjoyed it. And then the next thing that happened is my colleague Brian Lohman, uh, decides to start a group called Pulp Playhouse. And uh, this is probably early 88. And I almost didn't get into that group because he told me he wanted me in there. But, you know, he had other colleagues he had to take. So I don't know if you know Greg Proops. You ever heard of Greg Proops? Mm -hmm. He's been on Who's On Is It anyway. And, uh, mm -hmm. He's very, very talented. He also is a stand up. Uh, he had another gig. I mean, he couldn't do it. So he pulled out right when they were going into rehearsal. It's like Rafe. It's like yes, here I am. Because <laughs> I love, I, you know, I love literary and cinematic genres. I mean, I grew up on that stuff as a kid, and just love it. So, I mean, I played it. I played it on myself by myself, alone as a child, staying home, playing, cutting school, and staying home and pretending. I'm talking when I'm 10, 11 years old, pretending to be an international boy spy undercover as a nightclub singer and dancer, by the way. Uh, it, it was very involved. It, it, it was, 
Uh, so I did a lot of pretending that a if, dream come true. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. So uh, and then we did uh, stories, uh, imp improvised, narrated stories in the style of these different genres like horror, romance, western, etc. Uh, with each of us doing a scripted narrator, but an improvised story. And those stories would sometimes go 20 minutes. And at that point, that's the longest thing I had ever seen or done of one narrative. So that's like, ooh, they're starting to spread this out. Should I go on? Yeah, yeah. So, so, I mean, we're just uh, looking at the camera if, if there's a time? cut okay. from the camera. So that's the only limitation. Go okay. on. And if, it, if a show starts here on the stage, I think then we have to go. Okay, all right. All right. So, <laughs> what was the normal uh, length of a show? A show would be, oh, a regular show, improv show, would yeah. usually be a, a two hour show or an hour and a half show. But the pieces, the individual stories, like you mean the, the life piece, which was like a herald would go for like 40 minutes, but those individual stories inside of it would never go more than 10 minutes usually, at the, the most eight minutes. It just, yeah. I mean, people didn't seem to think it could happen and I, I wasn't pushing it. Uh, but, so, But the, the show was a little bit like today, so we have a, a two-part show in intermission, so the house sold some drinks and... Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Okay. yeah. But uh, because you told from Chicago, I think, that they have really short shows, like an, not even an hour, and then the next group. So like yeah, little, no, uh, you, have, you have two or three heralds, and the herald is between 20 and 20, 25 minutes now. Okay. I think uh, in former times they were lo longer, and they experimented a little bit with that. Okay. So, mm -hmm. so we did the, mm -hmm. the, these shows, and it was very exciting to do with the research. Uh, and I learned so many, so many things. So many great authors I, I found for the first time, like Jim Thompson. I don't know if you know Jim Thompson, a, a great American crime writer. Uh, so we're doing that, and uh, I'm also now I'm one of my own group too. Again, so uh, I because I, I've encountered students that are so gifted, so great. But, but sorry, before going to that, you you teach. Yes. in this time. Mm -hmm. uh, when, when did you start to teach regular? Let's see, I taught a little bit when I was with Flash Family back in, I'd say, probably 80. Uh, then, I think when I, I start really teaching when I come back to improv in like 86. One thing is I'm seeing these teachers, I'm studying with teachers who sometimes really don't know a lot, and I'm going, you know, well, I know this and that. So, so uh, I was able to talk to other students and say, well, you know, I can do a class for you, and, and that's how it started that way. Give, give these teacher a credit to their teachers? So like a little bit like, I learned this from this one, I learned it from this one, or is more everybody spreads his own word and said, that's, I'm uh, figured out by my own. No, I think you give, some of it's the basics, some, and you give credit when, when, you, when credit's due as much as you can. Uh, yes, but I'm, you know, I'm developing my own thoughts and, on it at that point. And, but you do it private or private. About, private? And then when I got to Bats Improv, I was quickly teaching for, for them. Yes, and then I was doing private classes. Uh, so uh, we're doing pulp playoffs, which is really fun. The great thing is, you know Michael McShane. He's he was he's a great actor. He at that point in San Francisco, he was the king of the city in a way because, I mean, acting wise, because he is now at ACT is our big theater company there, uh, you know, real theater company with big theaters and uh, the most well-known one, respected. And now he is, he is their main actor. I mean, he's, he's playing the main roles in things like uh, Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Forum, you know, he, the Zero Mustel role. He, he's doing these big things there. And uh, so then we're doing these late night shows with Paul Playhouse at the Eureka Theater, which is a hopping place. This is during the time that they're producing uh, Angels in America and, uh, and other great plays. So it's all this prestige. And suddenly, I'm now, suddenly everything goes, and I'm on this great stage where, uh, in this show that everybody wants to see because of the other people in it. And, and this, we're getting great press. It, it's just thrilling. And suddenly, I have to up my game. It's like, you better get better, Chase. Okay. Uh so, if I understand right, you, you never uh, uh, talk, took an, an acting school, really like an no. actor's training? No, I took, I took an acting class for, for nine months, but 
it wasn't really teaching me stagecraft. Mm. And then when I was in the early groups, we were in a club, so you didn't really need the, the, the stage chops that you need when you're playing a 200, 300 seat house on a big stage. I, that was a learning experience. I remember when Brian Loman said, um, we need to think in terms of a stage picture. What? You know, where, how we stand on stage, you know, in the scenes and, and balancing. It's like, oh my God, I have to do that too. <laughs> I have to. Uh, so, you know, then I had to bring that, build that in there. Uh, but eventually that just becomes second nature, which is, I'm so happy. Mm. Uh, so, uh, so we were doing, we were doing that and that was uh, very exciting to do those shows because, pardon me, it's the bubble water. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, the city's just really excited by us, and the work is so exciting. People haven't seen it, and it's it's pulpy, so it's very lurid and passionate. And you know, you get to go. I remember one show in a horror show where I did a striptease, but I was actually uh, cutting my own skin off and slowly peeling it off uh, as as striptease. It was very gruesome, but very fun. And uh, then uh, I had these students, as I mentioned, uh, including Stephen Kieran the great Stephen Kieran, uh, who uh, I wanted to work with, a great actor named Ed Hodson, Virginia Musanti, who my colleague from before has now come back to, uh, to improv, uh, and of course Regina. So I started a group called Improv Theater. And uh, I thought, uh, nobody's called it Improv Theater yet, so uh, I'm just going to call it Improv Theater. It sounds it's, it's a name. Theater yeah. and it's improv, and that's what we are. Uh, so this, that was great. We started Improv Theater. And... Uh, Ed Hodson was also an actor at ACT, so he had a he had an inn that gave us on certain dark nights or certain dark weekends the ACT playroom, which was at 350 Geary, I think. And it was a sweet little black box theater that we got for very little money. We didn't have to pay much, and it was this prime location. Uh, and so we started doing shows. So I got to experiment with some things, and but we, 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 I actually have to start generating product, which was a great, great impetus. And I'm experimenting with things in class. I thought, one thing I thought, well, if we can narrate a 20-minute story, can we narrate a 45-minute story? So one night, I, you know, I just put it down where I narrated a, 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 remember it was a World War I story that went 45 minutes, and that was, for us or anybody I'd seen up to that point, that was the only time that had ever been done. That's the first time one story over basically, you know, half of a night. Uh, so that worked. I was like, oh, that worked. So uh, <laughs> uh, I, and then in my own class, I had been experimenting with doing a, I, well, film noir is one of my favorite genres. So I, a film noir that was one long story, but where sometimes we wouldn't see what was going on, that somebody could have some other interaction across the room. It was very experimental. Uh, and it was fun and it worked. And I remember, I thought, we're gonna do this on stage. I'm gonna try this on stage. So uh, it was in June of 89, and there was eight of us players, uh, Cully, Fredri Cully Fredrickson, Ed Hodson, uh, myself, Stephen Kieran, Regina Saizi, Virginia Masanti, Teresa Roberts, and D Diane Rachel. Plus, we had two guests that night, Michael McShane and Ellen McLaughlin, who was playing in a head of gobbler over at Berkeley Rep. I mean, the, Ellen McLaughlin and Michael McShane are the biggest actors in the Bay Area. And they're guesting in this first long form, extended narrative long form. So uh, we did we did a film improvised film noir that night, and it was scary, so scary. Uh, I learned a lot that night. One thing is, I I had the major uh, archetypes on piece of paper. And we pulled them out, uh, and after doing that show, I thought you don't have to do that. What I learned was Look, this whole thing could be free form. That's what I I learned from that. Uh, but uh, it was the first extended narrative stuff, and. It, and it just like, wow, we can do one story over an entire evening. And now, it's so funny because everybody does it, but back then it was like, I remember the musician saying, 
don't you think you better have a backup in case this doesn't work? And I thought, no, no, let's just, just, just do it. So it's, isn't that funny how it could go from nobody doing it to now it's ubiquitous. So I think that's, yeah. that's, that's just fascinating. And then actually it's online. I, I found the video of it and did a little uh, uh, edited Eclipse version of it um, on the 25th anniversary uh, of, the, uh, of that show. So it's on Google, I mean on YouTube. And cool. Um, yeah, for me the question is, there was a Herald that was the long, long form. And, yes. Uh, it took, I mean, nearly 20 years to, to bring uh, a completely different thing up. That's for me really interesting. It so, is. Uh, People just didn't think it could be done. It just seemed, mm -hmm. it seemed preposterous. Uh, you know, basically, we stole the name long form out of it because that was what the Herald was called, and then we just just kind of appropriated it for what we were doing, and called what we were doing long form. Now, to make it more clear, I call it extended sto uh, narrative long form, yeah. or single story uh, Good long to form. Ad advertising ex <laughs> for plugins. Um, what was it? The audience? How the audience reacted on a on things like that because the audience I think you're you're trained to to go to a cinema and see a long form over two hours is not a problem or, or or a thing to go to a theater and see a long form in this size was it uh, because it was it an, an improv audience that said wow that's uh, that's strange because it was one game or or is it how do you react well you know <clears throat> one thing is We're, st we're like doing these little baby steps each week because the mm -hmm. week before that was when we did the 45 minute narrated story. Mm -hmm. So we did that. It's like, mm, all right, I'll do it. <laughs> uh, so uh, we're taking these little baby steps. The audience was right with us. I was very fortunate because I had such a charismatic, talented cast. Yeah. People were just so good that you could watch them do anything. <laughs> And um, so uh, uh, their whatever difficulties their their personal talent and charisma carried us over those but the audience was they were ready for it they were excited they were excited to be part of something experimental and uh, uh, they were right with us and that was that's uh, improv, uh, improv theater mm -hmm. it, they still they still working today or? no uh, no uh, it, it, they can't work because I'm it <laughs> I'm in charge <laughs> of that no we 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 we, we uh, kind of Drifted apart, split up. We were just doing different things. Yeah. It was just what it was for that time period. Uh, and then, of course, I got much more involved in bats, improv. Okay. And uh, and it, yes, and became true to just love the the work there. That's a great place, bats improv. Um, the uh, since it's p a player based, the 20 of us company players are all so we get, get to give input and uh, have a say. Oh, we have an artistic director. I was artistic director at one point. Uh, it's just a great place to be. It's, uh, we do so many different genres. Styles, and you, in fact, are part of that in that you came uh, in the summer and uh, uh, worked with us on Improvised Breck, which was so hard, but uh, I liked that. It was hard and it, was, it, it had to take me away from my, my stuff, which is that I care about is acting and engaging the audience emotionally and uh, uh, a strong narrative. And you're saying, you know, when it's, uh, when it's time for the audience to feel things, pull out of it. It's like, huh? Okay. <laughs> Why? <laughs> Why? I don't want to. But, But I, I loved it. And what I truly want to be is an infinitely flexible improviser where I can do everything as, you know, as best I can. But it, so that was a really great learning experience for me. And what, what I experienced at BATS was there's a group of people, really uh, wonderful, highly talented people. That's, that's really something uh, I noticed. And what I really admired was the, um, uh, how you work on, on new formats or new stuff. I saw you, uh, I saw you work out on, um, and I'm really pleased for that I had the chance to, to prison dramas. Oh yes, yeah, I directed those, yes. And what I see was, A workout or rehearsal for a show, and all what they did, they do really 100. Really, one. It was like okay, they're playing. They're just two people in the audience, but they're playing like the full house. Oh, yeah. And what what is it that bats is? I I don't know what was it that bats do this work so uh, 
passionate. I, I don't know if it's the right word for it. We, no, I don't. We're not cynical at all. The the company players aren't, and and we love the work. And you know, it's not always easy. We have all these personalities. There's been conflicts over the years, but but we we love immersing ourselves in in it, and and we have a commitment to excellence, the good kind of excellence, you know, uh, and uh, we. I love those players. I I love being someone else with them, and 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 being hurt by them or killing them or or you know whatever happens. Uh, and also since we do so many things, uh, I, it's like being some sort of a a movie star in that I get to be all these different things. I get to be the lead in a Hitchcock. Uh, I I I, I uh, get to play the little boy in the Dickensian story, and I get I get to be everything. Which is, and we do it with a commitment. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, for me, interesting um, Bay Area is that uh, a really center in the U.S. for improv. And um, do you have different spots there who are famous? I mean, there's the Groundlings in L.A. Yeah. Um, I I think the the biggest group in San Francisco now is Bats Improv. Uh, we don't. You know, like Groundlings and UCB, they sort of funnel people into uh, television or movies. And, yeah, that's not not really what we do. I mean, <laughs> it's, it's well, we just love doing what we're doing. You know, yeah. we're this theater company, and you know, I, I every year for the last 15 years, uh, at the end of the year, I tally up how many shows I go through my date book, how many shows that I do, and I tallied it up this past year, and I did 52 shows last year. And uh, I, my, I think it was four years before uh, I did 51, and that was the highest up to that point. So this year, which is my 36th year as an improviser, uh, I've done more shows in that year than I've ever done before. And I looked, I counted up everything from 1999, because that's when I started keeping track, and I've done 625 shows. I was like, wow, that's really yeah. wonderful. And it's great to be, you know, uh, at this age, at this point in my career, and be working more than ever. Yeah, that's, um, that's, a, that's a thing uh, about uh, being on stage. It's a, it's a little bit like a pilot who had to fly a lot of hours to had the right or the license to fly certain kinds of, of uh, um, how air, 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 aircraft, no. Crafts. Aircraft, yeah, yeah. Yes. Uh, so planes. That's the word I was looking for, <laughs> and and I think that's that's a point. Uh, uh, to be on stage, it's it's important to learn in a way. Yeah. Yes, there's things you can only learn on stage about being on stage. Yeah, yeah. I'm still learning those things. And you're teaching also. Still I teach a lot. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I teach at bats. Yes, I do. What, what's it's, your... it's so exciting. I'm so happy I do what I love. I uh, I feel very fortunate. That was my nightmare, is to somehow end up locked into something I loathe. Uh, so I feel very happy about this. But, you know, I, I recently taught a class at BATS with a lot of students I'd never seen before. And it's like, oh, it's that thing like with Regina. It's like, oh, look at you. You. You can just see it, man. Some people just have it. There's this woman named Karen uh, from Canada. It's like, well, you got it. You got it. And my job as a teacher is not to make you my student, but to, uh, as I said before in that other interview, to help them grow and give the hand, like, come up here. Come and be my colleague. And that's it was what happened with Stephen and Tim, uh, who were my students, who are my colleagues now in Three For All. So uh, it's, that's, that's the great thing, is you get to help make your own playmates. Yeah, yeah, and people you like, and I think that's that's the that's the two things you you had to bring together, talent and also uh, the chemistry you had to yes. to fit together, because if one is missing, I think if talent or or craft is missing, uh, you can learn yes. a lot of things. But if you don't like somebody who can play as good as he or she wants, it's just something. Um, I think we round a little bit, but I have a last last question, or maybe you have more questions to ask. Um, what 
your career is now at this point, but there are several years uh, for you to be uh, on stage and play. <laughs> Good, thank God. Of I course. was wondering. Uh, I, I know. <laughs> I don't want to uh, have any doubts on it. Okay. Um, now the thing is, um, what are you working on now? What what you what's your goal for the next year, for this year, for the next period? Well, my my never-ending goal is to grow as an improviser. So I'm I'm continually working on my craft, and uh, I also take classes and. Uh, Uh, and I, you know, directed by my fellow colleagues. So that is what's going on with me right now. I'm just happy that I got through these shows here in Amsterdam with the show time lapse that I uh, directed. That they asked me to come up with a format for a site-specific uh, show based on the place we're in. And uh, so uh, it's just well, I'll just turn my attention to the next thing. Next thing in uh, in San Francisco is improvised uh, farce. Which is it's got its its own challenges. So I'll be going to that when I return in February, and uh, and then just continuing to do my classes and just doing the next improv thing. So thanks, thanks You're a welcome. lot Thank you. for Thank having you. us and guiding us a little bit through the development of improv in the Bay Area and your own uh, life. Thanks a lot. You're and welcome. Yeah, I hope we see you many, several times more than 52 on stage. Okay, uh, that sounds good to me. Year. Yeah, right, this right. year, <laughs> yes. at least. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you.